I was at a gathering of pastors and missionaries one day, and I was just on the prayer team. I wasn't speaking. I was actually with my friend, Dr. Martin Sanders, uh, on a prayer team with him, and he's the head of the doctoral program where your pastor, Peter Ahn, has come, and so he knows Dr. Sanders. So anyways, Dr. Sanders and I were praying for some young woman that came forward looking for some ministry. She had a severe case of allergies. Uh, so severe, she was trying to get approved for a mission field, but her allergies were so severe, life-threatening, they wouldn't let her go. So she came for healing. And so Martin and I went to pray for her, and as soon as I laid my hand on this young woman, I immediately knew that the cause, the root of the allergies was demonic. Now, I have, at this point in my life, now I've seen it since then, but at that point in my life, I had never seen allergies associated with demonic stuff. So this isn't a normal thinking process. It's just a Holy Spirit moment. I looked at Martin. I said to him, this is demonic. And he looks and he nods. He goes, I, I think you're right. And so I looked at the girl. Again, she's in her 20s probably. I looked at her. I said to her, has there been witchcraft in your family? She goes, no. Her father was right in back of it, or he goes, doesn't even say anything. I go, Dad, well, you know, what are you keeping from her? Come on, let's talk about this. By the way, it's always a terrible thing to keep secrets from your children. You're leaving them in bondage sometimes. It's not a gift. This is the kingdom of light we belong to, not the kingdom of darkness. You can't use the tools of the kingdom of darkness to gain freedom in the kingdom of light. you got to be in the light. And so I just looked at him. I said to him, you know, what do you got to tell her? And so, you know, there was a lot of witchcraft in their family and apparently maybe, you know, a couple generations back. And so I said to her, listen, why don't you do a total life confession? Make sure that's all cared for. Let's pray and we'll do your deliverance. We did her deliverance the next day and she got completely free. The cool part was all of her allergies disappeared. Now she's been approved to go to the mission field. But that's not where the story ends. She knew two other people in her family who had the exact same allergies. She went and prayed over them, and they have both gotten free from demons and also from allergies that were connected to this witchcraft thing. Listen, this is why we need to do deliverance ministries. Let, let, me, let me give you a phrase that I use all the time that's super important. You ready? It is cosmic treason for the church to possess the keys of the kingdom and not to utilize them to set the captives free. This is something Jesus did, and he wanted us to do as well. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, which again, I would argue, should be translated the demonized, much better. It's not about ownership. Those having seizures and the paralyzed and he healed them. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening came, many who were demonized were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all the sick. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease. Interesting, if you read Luke's version of this commissioning of the 12, it says he gave them authority to drive out every demon and to heal disease. Between Matthew and Luke, we have authority to drive out every demon and heal every disease. That's what Jesus taught. Listen, deliverance is kingdom normal. When it's no longer normal in the church, that's because the church is abnormal to the culture of the kingdom that Jesus has created. I think our, my basic philosophy of ministry is just this. We simply ought to do the things that Jesus did. This isn't my idea. This is Jesus' idea. Matthew chapter 28, 
He commissions the disciples to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So Jesus commanded them to drive out demons, and he taught them to teach us to do everything he had commanded them, which means the church is commissioned to do deliverance ministries. And when the church is not doing deliverance, they're disobedient to Jesus. This is why it's so important we do this ministry, because Jesus was not a country bumpkin who couldn't figure out the difference between a psychological problem and a physical problem, and a spiritual demonization issue. The only reason Jesus did deliverance ministries is because Jesus realized that people were demonized and there was no other solution except deliverance for them to be set free. This is why we have to do it. So let's talk real practical today. I want to cover a couple things here with you today. First, I want to talk about how do spirits enter people, and then um, we're going to talk about how to get rid of them, okay? So first, let me talk about how they enter. Let me give you the big answer, and then I'll sort of walk through, you know, the parts, okay? But let me start with the big one. The big answer is sin, and I'll say what I mean and what I don't mean. First, let me talk about what I don't mean. What I don't mean, you know, you're, you're, you're sincerely trying to walk out your salvation, uh, you know, but you're still sinning. Everybody is, right? And so here's what I don't mean. I don't mean you're, you're walking out your salvation like this. You're getting up, and you take a step forward. You're doing all right, and then you fall down, and then you get up, and you fall down, and you get up, and you fall down, and, and you know, now you're going to get demons because you keep falling down. Nah, Jesus' grace and power will cover you from that. I don't mean that. I don't mean today you're driving out of wherever you live and, you know, somebody cuts you off and you have a really bad moment and you give them the universal sign of disapproval, you know, one finger, not that one. And then, you know, you're going to get a demon because you did that, which, no, I don't mean that, which is a good thing because, you know, I've driven in your neighborhood. I've seen the way some of you drive, you know. That's not what I mean. What I, what I do mean, well, first... There's a difference between I'm sincerely trying to walk out my salvation and I'm stumbling and bumbling and rebellion. Oh, now that's a different, that's a different matter altogether. Rebellion, the Bible says in the Old Testament, is as the sin of witchcraft. Remember I said to you last week, you're a spiritual being in a spiritual world. You're always giving away spiritual access. You don't get to choose if you give away access. You only get to choose to whom you give away access. You see, when you are acting in rebellion, you are essentially saying, I know what Jesus wants and I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. Well, you are at that point giving full-on access to, to the enemy of your souls. So yeah, that could end up with demonization. That's really possible. Well, some of this stuff, what happens is it's not just you, right? It's our families. Well, we got families sometimes that have lived in rebellion with the same sin issue for generations. Let's say adultery, right? And it's great grandpa and grandpa and dad and the kids. And it's generation after generation after generation, a sinful rebellion in adultery. Could that lead to demonization? Well, sure it could. Sure. So that kind of sin. And then there's just certain types of sin that when you participate in them, you're more likely to get demons or maybe definitely going to get demons. Okay, so let me start with one of the biggies. Let's say occult activity, any other religious practice, any form of witchcraft. Yeah, you practice other forms of religious practice, other forms of ceremony and, and covenantial behaviors, you're going to get demons. That's pretty much a one-to-one, -one, you know? And so that one's an easy one. There's other ones, though, that aren't one-to-one. -one. They're just uh, more likely. So let me talk about the category of sexuality for a bit, um, sexual sin. I don't understand everything I observe in my many, many, many years of doing deliverance ministry, but I'm going to tell you what I observe, not what I understand, okay? Somehow or another... 
demons can be transferred through sexual activity outside of the covenant. What I mean by that, God has established a covenantal system, and he wants one man, one woman, to be in a covenantal relationship called marriage for life. That be, is because it represents God's covenantal nature and faithfulness to one another and to the family and to the world, and he wants us to abide by that. It's also true, though, that it is a good, safe practice. Yeah, not just safe sex, but safe spirituality. Because when we go outside of that covenantal relationship, it is possible that through sexual activity, there can be a transference of demonic spirits. And I've seen it happen thousands of times. And so that's real, okay? So demons can be transferred through sex. So for example, I've never seen anybody that is engaged in prostitution that didn't pick up demons. And of course, when I say this to a church crowd, they're like, well, how many prostitutes did you know? Well, the reality is doing what I do for a living, I have delivered hundreds and hundreds of prostitutes at this point. Now, please hear me. Most of them weren't streetwalkers, though I have delivered those. Most of them weren't high-class escorts, though I have done deliverance on some of those. Most of them, it was really simple. They had some sort of habit, drug, alcohol, whatever it was, and they exchanged sex for something, money, drugs, favor, whatever it was. But listen, that, by definition is prostitution. And I'm telling you, when you cross that line, you get demons. Anybody who's ever given away sex in exchange for something else gets demons. That's a one-to-one. -one. There's no exception to that. Sometimes, sadly, you know, people get uh, demonic spirits through adulterous relationship. Sometimes people get demonic spirits through addiction. Sometimes people get demonic spirits through other practices of uh, sin that have been long embedded in a family. That, ha that happens. But, you know, Satan doesn't really fight fair. So sadly, sometimes you pick up demonic spirits because you've been abused. Now, if someone else is sinning against you. It's not your fault. But sadly, even so, demons can be transferred through abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, but most particularly sexual abuse. And many people pick up demons through sexual abuse. Listen, I'm going to be super direct. I'm going to talk to you like you're adults, okay? When there's any form of penetration, whether that's with a male organ, a finger, a tongue, or an object, when there's any form of penetration, it leads to demonization. I have never seen an exception to that. That is a one-to-one -one relationship. If there's fondling or something else, exposure, uh, that doesn't always lead to demonization, but it can. But when there is penetration, it leads to demonization. That is a reality in the spiritual world. It's like this invisible line that's crossed in the spiritual world, and that's what results. So, you know, these are some of the ways that these things enter. Let's talk for a second about how do we know, then, if we have demonic spirits. Um, the answer is they do manifest in some way within the person, so you will have some symptoms you know, when you have a disease, you have some symptoms. When you have uh, a de demonization, there are some presenting symptoms. So let me give you the most common presenting symptoms. First, um, sometimes people will say they hear voices. And it's like voices that they hear in their head sometimes that are audible. No one else is hearing it audibly, but to them it's audible. Other people would say they have thoughts that aren't their own almost, and they can't quite shut it off. Now hear me, they can overcome it. You know, James says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. For these people who have demonization, they submit themselves to God, they resist the devil, they can have victory over Satan's temptations, but the thoughts are like a leaky faucet in the back of their mind. They keep coming, drip, 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 and they can't shut it off, okay? That's a classic symptom of demonization. Some of those thoughts, for example, can be blasphemous thoughts. They're having blasphemous thoughts, even though they love Jesus. They don't want those thoughts, but there they are, drip, 
drip. They feel terrible about it. Some of those thoughts are condemning thoughts. You call yourself a Christian, then you have those thoughts like that. You call yourself a Christian, and you do that. How can you call you? You, and they call you names, and they belittle, and they demean, and they condemn. And you know what? Again, you can submit yourself to God, resist the enemy. You can overcome condemnation, but the thoughts drip, drip, drip. Some of the thoughts are like suicidal thoughts. Now, I'm not talking about something that's just human and normal, like, you know, you had a really bad year, and you think, man, I wish I was never born. That's normal. That's human. Anybody would have that. I mean, you're driving down the street. It's a super sunny day. It's really your optimal temperature out there. You're listening to your favorite music. And as you're driving down the street, taking it all in, feeling really good, you have this thought, I should drive into a tree. I should drive off a bridge. I should drive into oncoming traffic. Well, listen, that's not normal. That's demonic. And some people have those kinds of suicidal thoughts like that. Some people, the thoughts are actually homicidal, like their thoughts of mutilated bodies, their thoughts of acts of violence, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the Gadarean demoniac probably had both. You know, he had a spirit of death and a spirit of suicide, and he had both. That's why he's both violent as well as self-harming. Remember, he's a cutter. Mark chapter 5 cuts himself with stones. So, you know, sometimes you have these thoughts you can't control. For some people, there's like rage. They have this intense, supernaturally empowered anger that comes upon them. Again, the Gadarene demoniac would have that also. For some people, it's just like they feel tormented or tortured all the time. They can't lose it. They're living a tormented life. That's how they feel. For some people, again, they'll have thoughts of self-harm and even cut themselves. That's super common. You notice with an increase in experimentation in this younger generation, there's an increase in cutting. Well, of course. Well, of course there would be. Okay. Um, Then I'll give you one last thing, and, you know, this one, Again, I'm going to be a bit graphic, but I'm here to help you, not to hurt you. So just understand, I'm trying to give you symptoms that can actually help you to get free, okay? For some people, they're having trouble with sexual thoughts. And I'll give you different categories or sexual experiences. So let me give you different categories. So one, uh, for some people, they can, they've had erotic sexual thoughts before puberty, like l- sometimes long before puberty. I'm talking four, five, six years old sometimes, okay? Now, work with me for a second. It is not developmentally possible to have erotic sexual thoughts at five years old, okay? Now, I'm not talking about curiosity. Curiosity is developmentally normal. I wonder about boys and girls, you know, whichever one I am, I'm wondering if everybody has the same parts or different parts. I mean, curiosity, that's normal. When it's eroticized, it's lustful. Five-year-olds don't lust. That's not developmentally normal or even possible. When that happens, that's because there's something demonic going on. Many times, it does not, by the way, mean that they themselves were abused. That is possible. But many times, what actually happened was they inherited demonic spirits from someone else, mom, dad, grandmas, grandpas, who was sexually abused or raped. So they start getting these sexual images really early on in life before development is even possible. I'll give you a second symptom. For some people who have sexual spirits, uh, they have actually been in worship or Bible reading or prayer, and all of a sudden they're getting sexual images. They feel really dirty. They feel really bad. Again, they feel condemned, but it's not their fault, but they're getting these images. Third, sometimes they're going to bed at night and they feel a dark, intimidating, bullying presence in the room with them at night, and they'll feel scared, even terrified. Fourth symptom, sometimes the thing actually lays on top of them and they experience what is known as sleep paralysis. Listen, hundreds of thousands of people Google this every year because it's such a common experience. But sleep paralysis is actually a demonic sexual spirit pinning someone to the bed. A lot of times people want to cry out for help. Christians often say they want to cry out to Jesus, but they can't cry out. It doesn't usually last longer than a minute or two, and then it kind of goes past. Again, there's a lot of fear and terror even. It's very bullying, intimidating. That's what they do. 
Uh, next symptom, sometimes they'll have sexual dreams. And I'm not talking about, you know, s sort of normal, occasional sexual dream. I mean, these things are, they're often gross. I mean, sometimes they're perverted. Sometimes you're having dreams about someone that's a family member that you would never have sexual thoughts towards, and all of a sudden you're having this dream and you feel really dirty and gross. Sometimes it's like you're a seductress. Sometimes you're an abuser. Sometimes you're being chased to be abused or raped. And you'll have these terrifying thoughts and dreams. And, and you know, again, you'll wake up feeling really bad, but it's not you. It's demonic. And for some people, sadly, um, they wake up in the night and they feel like something is having sex with them, but there's nothing in the room. They have all the symptomatic expressions of a sexual experience, but there's no one there, and it's actually a demonic spirit engaging them in sexual activity. Uh, if it's a male partner, then it's an incubus spirit. If it's a female partner, it's a succubus spirit. The incubus and the succubus are ancient deities of sexual abuse. And listen, friends, a lot of times people inherit this stuff. You know, grandma got raped, never talked about it, nobody knew, and then the whole family is experiencing these kinds of symptoms. This stuff happens all the time in families because we don't always talk openly and honestly about these kinds of experiences. So you got to know the symptoms. Now, hear me for a second. Some of you are experiencing some of these symptoms I've just described. And I'm just going to say to you, there's hope. We can get rid of these things. Jesus has victory over this. We're going to do a soul care conference for your church in January. And I'm telling you, sign up. We're going to do it live stream. And sign up for that, and we'll help you get free, okay? But let me talk a little bit about how do we get rid of these demonic spirits. What do you need to do to prepare yourself for a deliverance? Let me give you the key principles, okay? Number one, the key principle really, let me start with the overall, and then I'll give you the three pieces of it. But the overall principle, the most important principle, is what I call the principle of ground, or it's what I've been using this word, access. Again, you are a spiritual being in a spiritual world. You're always giving away spiritual access. You do not get to choose if you give away access. You only get to choose to whom you give away access. So when you pick up the tools of the kingdom of darkness, you are giving access to Satan. When you pick up the tools of the kingdom of light, you are giving access to God. So think with me, for example, about Paul when he writes in Ephesians chapter 4, 27 and 8. And so he says, in your anger, do not sin. In so doing, he says, well, do not let the sun go down on your anger. In so doing, give the devil a foothold. Okay? Literally, the word there for foothold, some translations use stronghold, but the literal word in Greek is the word tapos. That's the word we get topography from. It literally means ground. And often in Greek, it means an inhabited place. That's the principle of access. What Paul is saying is this, when you've been hurt by someone else, if you pick up the tool of the enemy of bitterness, anger, grudge holding, resentment, you are giving access to the enemy of your soul. And that can become an inhabited place if you're not careful. That's the principle of access. That's why we want to continually give access to God, continually say yes to God. That's what he's saying, okay? We don't want to become people of rebellion. Now, let me give you the three big access points. First, sin. Now, in order to break the access point of sin, this is super easy. This is a 1 John 1. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all we need to do with this one is simply bring it under the blood, bring it into the light, confess it before the Lord. That's it. Now, hear me. A lot of times, demons, they try to trick you. And they bring up stuff you've already confessed. Please hear me. If you've already confessed it, it's already covered. It's already under the blood. It's already in the light. And all that is, when they're bringing up something you've already confessed, is condemnation. Condemnation is not ground. 
That's not an access point. All they're trying to do is deteriorate your foundation, your identity in Christ. Instead of reconfessing something you've already confessed, you need to reposition yourself in your identity in Christ and go, no, I'm in Christ. I'm forgiven. I brought that to Jesus. That one's covered by the blood. And you take your stand. That's what you need to do with that one, okay? So sin, if you've already confessed it, it's covered. There's no access if you've already confessed it. Second access point, secrets. Now hear me for a second. I'm not talking about your secrets. Why? I'm assuming you've already confessed your sin under number one, okay? So what do I mean by secrets? Now I'm talking about your family secrets. Sadly, Demons can hide in the family tree in the secret places. Let me give you an example of how this one works. I was teaching a uh, class one day for the seminary. This was probably 20 years ago. And um, this, this particular day, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and the Lord says to me, this class is full of demons. You got to understand my relationship with God. I think I'm funny, and so does he. And so I just said to the Lord, I'm like, uh, you know, uh, that could have waited till 6 a.m. To which the Lord, by the way, thinking he's also funny, and I think he's funny too, he says to me, there are some things I only tell my 2 a.m. friends. Touche. And so I said to the Lord, okay, why'd you tell me that? He said, listen, you've been so far doing deliverance one person at a time, pastoral appointment, somebody comes in, you do their deliverance. I want you to do a group test and I want you to get the whole class free. I'm like, okay. So I go in the next day. I was actually teaching a class with my buddy Martin and Martin's in there, you know, and I said to Martin, I said, uh, hey, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. He's like, really? what did he tell you? I said, he told me this class is full of demons. He goes, Full? I'm like, that's what he told me. Yeah, full of demons. He goes, what do you want to do? I go, I got an idea. He goes, you lead, I'll follow. I said, okay. So I dive in, and I do a test on the whole class, which at that conference, we'll do a test on everybody, right? So I do this group test. When I do this group test, I got about 30 students in the class. 25 of them have demonic stuff. And to which, you know, Martin looks at me, and he goes, and now what, big boy? To which I just looked at him and I said, now we're going to equip them and train them how to do deliverance and we'll be the coaches. He's like, okay. So I train them how to do deliverance. They're doing deliverance with each other and we're coming around and coaching. When they needed help, they'd run up and get us, right? So anyways, this one group comes running up to me like their hair is on fire. And I go over and there's this guy who is in a catatonic state. Like he can't move. He can't talk. He can't even hardly blink. When he blinks, it's slow motion. It's like super slow-mo, you know? It was really weird. So I'm like, you know, I've never seen at that point in my life a mute spirit, so they think I know what I'm doing, but sometimes I have no idea either, right? I mean, it's new to me, too. It's a freaky world out there. And so I just look at him, and I'm like, uh, I command you to speak in Jesus' name. And the guy just goes... But nothing comes out. I'm like, well, that didn't work. I'm like, I loose your tongue in Jesus' name. And again, he just goes, and nothing comes out. So, you know, listen, when you don't know what to do, you go to the one who knows all things, and you wait upon him until he reveals what to do. That's what you do. God is smart. He knows stuff we don't know. That's theology 101, okay? So I sit down. I wait on the Lord, and I'm like, okay, what do I do with this thing? And uh, the Lord says to me, he has a secret. And I'm like, he who? Listen, this guy, this guy's name was Jeff that I was doing the deliverance on. This guy had been brutally honest with me all week long, right? He had told me things that no one had ever confessed to me at that point in my life. So I knew in my heart of hearts that this man did not have secrets. And so I said to the Lord, he who? And the Lord said to me, the demon. I'm like, the demon has a secret? I'm like, is that legal? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right, what do I know? It's your universe, not mine. Okay. So I look up from this moment, and I say to the Spirit, the Lord told me you have a secret. Is that true? And a voice comes out of Jeff's inner being. He never even opens his mouth, but this voice comes out and goes, yes, which was kind of creepy, actually. And, uh, and that kind of gave me the chills. And I, I just uh, I said to the Spirit, you step aside in Jesus' name. In other words, let Jeff go. I want to talk to Jeff. And so the spirit steps aside. Jeff comes back. And I looked at Jeff, and I I didn't know. I said to him, could you understand that? 
He's like, yeah, I could understand everything. I just couldn't move. I said to him, okay, bud. I said, do you know what the secret is? He said, Rob, I've told you everything. I said, I believe you. I said, here's the deal, man. I think it's in your family. There's a secret in your family that's giving these demons a leverage point, an access point. And I said, we need to expose it to the light of God. Well, listen, you know, whenever there's a secret that needs to be exposed to the light, there's only two paths to get there. One, natural knowledge. In other words, you have conversation with your people, with your family, and you ask all the uncomfortable, awkward questions you've never wanted to ask before, but you really needed to know. And you get it through natural knowledge. Or two, you have to get it through supernatural knowledge. I got to tell you, a lot of times, if you can get it through natural knowledge, you're not courageous. God won't always give it to you. So in Jeff's case, uh, you know, I said to him, I said, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to sit with the Lord. And I said, "Uh, I think the Lord's going to reveal this to you, Jeff, tonight. Now, tomorrow's the last day of class. Next week you graduate. I think the Lord doesn't want you to graduate with demons. So I think he's going to give it to you tonight. And uh, so he does. He goes home. He sits with the Lord. He doesn't eat dinner. He's fasting. And he said it came like 30 pictures, like a slideshow, over about three hours. And what the pictures revealed to him was that he had been molested by his uncle when he was an infant, like a newborn baby, a young, young baby. And, you know, he knew his, his uncle was in jail for pedophilia. But as far as he knew, he had never even had any contact with his uncle. So he calls his mother And he says to his mom, he said, hey, did I ever meet Uncle So-and-so? She's like, yeah, well, he lived with us for the first three or four months of your life. Now, hear me for a second. His family didn't know at that point that this uncle was a pedophile. Nobody knew that, right? That got exposed later on. So they weren't being neglectful or anything like that. And so, you know, he he didn't want to lay it on his mother, so he just finished the conversation, hung up. He comes in the next day, tells me, and I said, that's it. That's the secret. I said, all right, let's call this thing back to attention. I call the spirit back to attention. As soon as I call it to attention, he's back in this mute state. Can't speak, can't move. You know, he's just catatonic again. I said to the spirit, Jesus showed him that his uncle molested him. That's your secret. Is that truth before God? And again, this voice comes out of his inner being. Yes. And at that point, you know, I guess I'm like, I named that spirit, got rid of it, got rid of the spirits that were underneath it, kicked them all out, did a test. He's totally clean. Please hear me for a second. That guy struggled with the desire to touch children his whole life. He had not gotten married. He was in his 30s. He had not gotten married because he was afraid if he got married and had kids of his own, he would touch his own children. He ended up after that never having a desire to touch children again, never having any images in his head to touch children again. He got completely free, ended up getting married, has kids of his own. Once again, let me say it. It is cosmic treason for the church to possess the keys of the kingdom and not to utilize them to set the captives free. Jesus wouldn't do it. He'd get people free. So you got sin. You know, sin you just need to confess. You've got secrets, those you need to expose through natural knowledge by having tough conversations or supernatural knowledge. And the third piece of access, the third access point that we have to deal with are curses. When you study the Bible, the biblical concept of curses is there from Old through New Testament. It's just, unfortunately, for lots of us, you know, our Western worldview once again has blinded us to our biblical lenses so that we can't see some of this stuff, so we don't have any categories for this stuff. But let me give you the three types of curses that are there. I want to differentiate between someone who has no indwelling demonic spirit. They're not demonized, okay? They can still have curses that need to be broken off of them. And a curse, when it's an exterior thing like that, can be a demonically reinforced pattern of behavior or thought process to break the curse brings alleviation and and a quicker pathway to freedom. But... When a person has indwelling demons, so there's a demon in the suitcase of the soul, and there's a curse, sometimes what happens is that curse becomes like a gateway that when you kick the demon out, because you didn't break the curse, the demon has an access point, an entry point to return. It gets back into the house, back into the suitcase, back into the soul. 
So that, let me give you three types of curses. You ready? Number one, first type of curse would be a religious curse. Religious curse. All religions, including Christianity, all religions are ceremonial and covenantial in nature. And so the key that gives a demonic spirit access is when you've participated in a ceremony or participated in a covenant that gives someone access. There are basic ceremonies in religion. For example, all religions, including Christianity, have dedication ceremonies. Uh, often there are baptism ceremonies of some sort. There are, in many religions, fertility ceremonies, both for reproduction as well as for the fertility of a land. There are prosperity ceremonies. There are power ceremonies, spiritual power as well as you know political power or so. Um, and, and there are also sometimes marriage ceremonies, healing ceremonies. So when we participate in these ceremonies, which ceremonies usually involve things like water, fire, light, or blood, when we participate in these ceremonies with those particular things, offerings, sometimes grain offerings, for example, when we participate in these ceremonies and we make covenants, we we bring a curse upon our family. Now, hear me for a second. When your mother, let's say, dedicates you, let's say, you know, someone who's born in Santeria and their mother dedicates them in the religion of Santeria, listen, that mother wants good for her child. She doesn't mean to curse her child. But you see, demons never bless they only curse. As a result, that dedication done in Santeria becomes a curse. Okay? So the first set of curses are religious in nature. Second set of curses that we need to deal with are behavioral curses. This is the Deuteronomic curse. You know, the sins of the parents visit their children. When a family, a tribe, a nation sins in the same direction, generation after generation, there's this rebellion that's happening. When that happens, it becomes a demonically reinforced pattern of behavior. It's a curse. That's a behavioral curse, and it needs to be broken in Jesus' name. Third type of curse would be a word curse. So James talks about two types of wisdom. The first type is pure religion in James' words. He means that in a good way. It's motivated by the Holy Spirit. It's motivated by good emotions, love, etc. And that's a word of wisdom. Uh, and, and, and it's a positive, beneficial word that is given to encourage and build up, right? But he talks about a second type of wisdom, which he means in, cult, in, in quotes. And listen, he's talking about revelation. He's talking about the false prophetic is what he's really talking about. That second type of wisdom, he says, is demonic. And it's motivated by false motivation, not by love, not by good, but by envy, pride, selfish ambition, I would add bitterness, okay? So what's happened is someone has envy towards someone else or bitterness towards someone else. They are giving the enemy access. So the enemy, now that he has access, gives them a compelling word for this person, and they say, the Lord told me, and then they let him have it. But that's a curse. Sometimes a word curse is something we speak over ourselves. I will never trust anyone again. That's a word curse, okay? When there's a word that's spoken over us or we speak over ourselves and there's an indwelling demonic spirit, again, unless I break that, they can leave and come back. And that's why I need to break those curses. Let me close this particular talk with a final story. That was that same ATS class that Jeff was in. There was another guy in the class. His name is Anson. And both Jeff and Anson have given me permission to tell their story. They're actually in the book, Soul Care. Another group of students comes running up to me. Their hair's on fire also. They're like, we need your help. I come over, and there's this guy, Anson. He's, he's on the floor. He's like slithering like a snake, and there's a voice that's coming out of him that is not human, and it's not English. And there's like 14 languages spoken in this class. So I just looked around the room and said, does anybody recognize the language? Everybody's like, 
I'm like, speak in English. Listen, these things are evil to the core, but they're super smart. So he speaks in English. Again, it's still this voice that's not human, but he speaks in English. I'm not into this deliverance two minutes, and all of a sudden I know deep inside, I know something's off. I said, Spirit, step aside. Anson, get up in the chair. He gets up in the chair. I said to him, Bud, I said, something's wrong. He goes, what? I go, I don't know. I said, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, okay? He said, sure. I said, have you been through deliverance before? He's like, yeah, five times before. I said, what happens? He goes, we kick them out. We do a test. I'm clean. There's nothing left. But then they always get back in. They always return. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I said, who's done your deliverance? He told me, I know the people. They used a similar methodology that I used to use before I learned these lessons that I'm teaching you. And I said, you know, uh, we're in trouble. He goes, what's that mean? I go, I don't know, buddy. I said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I know how to do. If it doesn't work, I'm going to figure out what to do. He said, all right. So I do the deliverance. I kick them all out. We get through. I do a test to make sure there's no indwelling spirits, just like 1 John chapter 4 tells us. There's nothing left. I finish the process. I think we're good. I see him three months later. He comes up to me three months later. I said, hey, bud, how you doing? He goes, not good. They're back. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. I said, I'll tell you what, we happened to be doing a class together. Martin was there, too. I said, let's pray and fast tomorrow. It was Saturday. I said, we'll pray and fast breakfast, lunch. We'll eat dinner. We'll brainstorm. We'll see if we have any new ideas. Sunday, before we leave this weekend that we're doing together of ministry, we'll, we'll do another round. And there was a class there, and plus it was at my church. So, you know, I had about, I don't know, 60, 70 people in the room watching this thing, which, you know, Anson approved. It was a good teaching moment. So I call up the spirit. He falls out of his chair. He's slithering like a snake. A voice comes out of him that is not human. It's not English. It's the exact same spirit I first encountered three months earlier. And I'm looking to see if there's any ground, right? And the only ground I understood back then was sin. So I'm checking to see if he's got any sin that's unconfessed. There's nothing there. I'm trying to figure out how this thing got back in. I can't figure it out. I finally looked at my buddy Martin. I said to him, Martin, I said, do you know what to do? And remember, there's like 60 or 70 people watching us. And he looks at me and he goes, I have no idea. And then he says, do you? I said, I wouldn't have asked you if I knew what to do, bud. No, I don't know what to do. And then I look up, and everybody's eyes are like as big as saucers, right? And they're all like, you idiots, what are you doing, right? And I'm like, relax. Jesus knows what to do. He'll tell me. And as soon as I said it, a word pops to my head, Godfather. And I'm like, Godfather? Now, Anson's Chinese. He was born in mainland China. To my knowledge, I didn't even know that Chinese people had Godfathers. So I'm like, that can't be right. It's got to be Grandfather. So I go, Grandfather. And the Spirit goes, Godfather. I'm like, that's what I heard. All right, step aside. The Spirit steps aside. I said to Anson, you got to tell me the story about your Godfather. I never heard this. I said, I didn't even know Chinese culture had Godfathers. He goes, well, he said, I was born on a Chinese holiday known as the Gates of Hell. All right, just for the record, if you get to choose any day you're born, don't choose that one, okay? So he's born on a Chinese holiday known as the Gates of Hell, and his parents, wanting to protect him from the Gates of Hell, take him down to the ancestor temple, and they offer, in the name of the Godfather, with the Godfather doing the sacrifice, they offer a sacrifice on his behalf, and they dedicate him to protect protect him. But again, a dedication done in any other name except Jesus is not a blessing. It's a curse. Even though the parents and the Godfather mean it as a blessing, demons only curse. So they forced a gate open in his soul. And every time somebody kicked it out, it would just come right back in. We broke the curse. We kicked him out. And he's completely free. I just saw him, I don't know, a couple of months ago in the midst of this COVID. I guess I Zoomed with him. And, you know, he's totally free. See, this is the power of Jesus. Listen, friends, there are things sometimes in your life that are demonic in their rootedness. Not everything is demonic. Plenty of stuff's just you. It's human. But there are some things that are demonic. And the reason Jesus did deliverance ministries is because when there's a demon at the root, there's no other solution but 
deliverance. And the good news is Jesus has come to set you free. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the freedom that is ours in Christ. Thank you that Jesus is the name above every name, that Paul says at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, both on the earth and under the earth. He is that ruler of the universe. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, every name that can be given. He is the King. And he is the king alone. He has no competition for his throne room. And there is victory and there is freedom in Jesus. Now, many of these folks here today, Lord, listening to this thing, you know what? They're going to have some demonic stuff. It's real. Many of them are going to need freedom. But you, you are the liberator. You are the redeemer. You are the one who can set us free. And so I pray, Lord Jesus... As we come to, in a couple of weeks, to this soul care conference for Metro Church, that many, many, many people would be set free in Jesus' name, for Jesus' kingdom, for Jesus' glory. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope you're, that you are challenged by Pastor Rob's sermon and that... Um yeah, that you were just really challenged by his testimony towards uh, just God's, uh, to Rob's testament towards God's power and the way that's been working and the way that he's seen it work uh, today. So we do have some next steps for you. The first is I am committing my life to Jesus for the first time. If this is you, this is great news. This is the best news for us. Um, and we celebrate with you. And in celebrating with you, we'd like to walk with you as well. Um, please check that off. Please submit the comp card uh, if you are doing this. And someone will reach out to you. They will pray for you. They will answer any questions that they have, uh, that you might have. And yeah, they would just be happy to walk along this journey with you. The second is I will receive prayer through Metro's virtual prayer rooms today. Uh, like we said uh, during the announcements, there is virtual prayer today. It is live please definitely check that out. If you just go to the link, uh, click the link, you'll be sent right into the room and someone will guide you to a pastor who is more than happy to pray for you today. The third is please send me more information about the virtual soul care conference from January 14th through 16th. So if you're new with us, um, we've been covering the soul care series by going through Dr. Reamer's book, Soul Care. But he does do a conference himself in which he goes into uh, each principle but on a very, very in-depth level. So we know that soul care has been um, very effective. It has been very eye-opening for many of us at our church. Um, and if this is something that you want to pursue, especially if you would like to look towards deliverance, definitely, definitely sign up for the soul care conference. If finances are an issue, please feel free to email me or anyone at our church uh, regarding uh, financial aid. And the last is, please send me more information. Oh, the th sorry, the second to last is, I will give generously to the Christmas offering. Uh, we are doing our Christmas offering. It is running as we speak. Um, the Christmas offering funds uh, our Metro Community Center uh, here in Englewood and, you know, all the activities and the things that we do with that. And it also funds a bunch of missionaries that have come out of our church and are doing incredible work all over the world. Uh, do we have an update, Tim, on how much that we've raised, we've raised so far? Uh, $16,754.37. Thank you. It's coming in. Uh, we're so thankful and uh, we do believe that God is working in our church convicting and he is going to do a powerful thing with this money. And finally, the last is, please send me more information on how I can participate on the angel tree this Christmas. Like I said, we're trying to bless a child this Christmas and we're trying to make uh, Christmas Day just a brighter day for them.